We are in a continuing study on Sunday night. We're talking about particularly the number seven. We're talking about seven in prophecy. And that goes back to the Old Testament in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, where that the Lord told Israel, he said, he said, I'll punish you seven times for your sin. We've been talking about the seven candlesticks. The seven candlesticks was on the south side was what was called the temple. We might call it the temple proper. The seven candlesticks were on the south side of the temple. You all notice I always draw it that way because the on the eastern end of the, this is north, south, uh, west, hold on, west and east, on the eastern end of the temple was the entrance into the temple or the tabernacle, and on the south side of the tabernacle was the seven candlesticks. Since God said he never changes, the word change means to duplicate, Malachi 3, 6, or to mutate. He never has two meanings for one thing. When you find the seven candlesticks on the south side of that tabernacle, the seven candlesticks were referred to as the face of God. Well, Glenn is always talking about, I preached on, on the bread. Uh, I did a bread series talking about the bread. And the, and the table of showbread was on the northern side, and there were 12 uh, loaves of showbread arranged in an exact orderly arrangement, and it was called the bread of the arrangement. And when the priest came into, the, into that tabernacle, they had to eat this bread that was their sustenance while they were on duty for a week. And then they'd change the priests on the Sabbath. And you had the altar of incense and the, and the, uh, the veil of the tabernacle and, the, and, and inside the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies, we even talked about how we are a picture of all of this in the New Testament church or the New Testament Israel. People say, I don't like it. It don't matter whether you like it, it's the truth. We are spiritual Jews circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. If you can discover what these seven candlesticks are, you can actually understand the number seven all the way through the scripture. And the number seven is the number of the refined, refined church. And, and, the, and that was called the face of God, the candlesticks. And the priests would come in and they had to eat that bread facing the candlesticks or facing what, what Zechariah called the candlesticks. He said, these seven are the eyes, the eyes of the Lord, of the Lord. And the eyes of the Lord go throughout the whole earth in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. The eyes of the Lord protect God's people. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, and to and fro is a synonym for the word earthquake, because the word earthquake is the word seismos, and the destruction, the destruction of Babylon will be by an earthquake. Now this has to be, this earthquake has to be spiritual, it has to be a spiritual quake, because Babylon is a system of wealth and self worldwide. So when you're talking about the eyes of the Lord, the destruction of the destruction of Babylon will be by the pronouncement of the eyes of God or the seven trumpets. Well, let's start with seven seals. The seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials and the seven trumpets, seven seals, and seven vials, they have to do with the eyes of the Lord because we find the definition of that in the first chapter of uh, Revelation. But before we read that, we talked about the first six trumpets, and we may go back to the sixth trump in, uh, uh, in the book of Revelation. But before we do, look at Titus. We're going to talk about the seventh trumpet and what happens at the seventh trumpet. What happens at the seventh trumpet, two particular things happen. Two things happen at the signing of the seventh trumpet. First of all, 
uh, when the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery, the mystery of God is finished at the sounding of the trumpet, and Babylon, Babylon is destroyed. Now, Babylon is an international city. Anywhere you find wealth and self, you're going to find that because Babylon was built in Genesis 11, 4. They said, let us make us a name, and the word name is Shem, and Shem was the prophet of God. He was the high priest of God, and he was the second-born son of Noah. When they said, let us make us a name, the very essence of Babylon is pride. We said this morning that Babylon is called a mountain of pride in Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, and God said he's going to make Babylon in Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, he said, Babylon will be a burnt mountain. That's exactly what the Scripture tells us when Babylon is brought to the ground. When Babylon is crushed, it will be a burnt mountain, and it will be a mountain of self and wealth. It's the worldwide system. It's not Tokyo, or it's not Washington, D.C., or London, and it's not just Rome. It's international Rome. It is internationally the international city of pride and self and wealth. And I don't know any nation in the world that is corrupting the world and that is as much Babylon as the United States of America because we preach pride, wealth, self, self-esteem. The Bible says in, in 1 John 2 and 16, in 17, or 15, 16, 17, when, he's, when John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that word pride is the word aladzonia, L-A-Z-O-N-I-A. And that means self-confidence or self-esteem is what it means. Now, America is preaching self-esteem more than any nation in history. I believe the reason people can't find <coughs> America in the Bible because they're looking for something righteous. It is a very part of the great world Babylonian system of self and wealth and me and what I want. And that's going to be destroyed at the sounding at the seventh trump, the seventh trump, we've talked about the first six trumpets, but the seventh trump will be at the end of time, and that's called the last trump, or the last in a series of sounds after which no other will sound. And the word last is the word E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S. We get our word eschatology from that, and the word eschatology means a study of the end times. And when you look at the word eschatos, we get the word echo from that. And what is an echo? It's a series of sounds. It's what it is. And when you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the last in that series, or the last in the series of trumpets in the 8th, ninth, and 10th chapter of Revelation, when the final one sounds, the mystery of God will be finished. That is the church. And I don't know why people don't see that. It's very obvious. And it is the time of the destruction of Babylon. But first of all, what we're looking for is the sounding of that trump and the appearance of Christ. Look at our hope over here in Titus. I haven't showed you this. Uh, in Titus 2, in verse 11. Now, I'll be honest with you. First time I ever saw this, clearly, I got this out of George Eldon Ladd's book called The Blessed Hope. He said, our hope is not in the sounding of a secret gathering in the sky. He, this is obvious, another, uh, another scripture that shows that our hope is not a secret pre-tribulation rapture. He tells you what our hope is. The word hope, the word hope is the word E-L-P-I-S. It comes from the word E L. P-I-Z-O, and that word means to anticipate, to anticipate, anticipate a promise. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, if you tell your wife that you're going to bring home uh, some Chinese food because you got a taste for Chinese food and you stop by the and you call her and you say don't cook honey I'm gonna come home and I'll be there at 530 now when we think hope 
we think wish. I sure do hope I get rich, and I hope I get me a new job, and I hope. Well, that's not the Bible word hope, because that word hope means to anticipate something that's been promised to you. So when you hope for a new job or hope for a raise, that's not the Bible word hope. Our word, this word hope, is when we've been promised eternal life, as Jesus has promised us, our hope is that we anticipate what has been promised. Well, Jesus said he would return and notice what that hope is. Let's read it here in Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, or pas ho, all nations, Gentiles, as well as Jews, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for, as we're living for Christ, what are we looking for? Are we looking for a pre-tribulation rapture? No. Uh, well, the, no man knows the day nor the hour, do they? No. But he says, you're not the children of the darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You will know the season, and we will be looking for something particularly. We'll be looking for the blessed hope, our blessed promise, the appearance of Christ, and it won't be a secret. We're going to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Now, why are we looking for the glorious appearing? His glorious appearing, his appearing is what we call an epiphany, E-P-I-P-H-A-N-Y, and it goes with the word coming. Every time we see, speak of the coming of the Lord, the majority of the times it is this word, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, -A, parousia, and that word parousia means physical, physical arrival, physical arrival. That does not mean, it means he's going to come to us here upon the earth and he's going to arrive. That word parousia was used often when it was said that Paul, when Paul was come to Corinth, he arrived there. Now he's not going to be somewhere way up in the sky before the tribulation. Yes, he's going to come, but he, this is not going to be a secret appearing. He's going to be, it's going to be a glorious appearing as Matthew the 24th chapter tells us that when any man says that they've seen Christ in a secret chamber, don't you believe it? Because as the lightning shines out of the east, even unto the west, so shall also the coming, the parousia, the physical arrival of the Lord be, and it will be glorious because it will light up and shine across the earth. Now, this don't sound like a secret appearing, does it? It's not a secret appearing looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for, is the glorious appearing when he shines from one end of the heavens to the other. The Bible doesn't talk about two raptures. And the word rapture is okay. It's just a Latin word that means, it means to be enraptured or to be taken out or swept away. And when we're swept out, the difference is, is time element. This is going to happen at the seventh trumpet, the last in a series of sounds, after which no other trumpet will sound. One more time, over in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at it one more time. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 51, you know, I noticed that you can listen to these preachers read this, and they, most of them never finish the verse. Here's the way most of them read it. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And they stop there. And they don't show the time element. The next phrase is called the time element of his coming. It is his glorious appearing. Then it says, let me read that 52nd verse again. We'll be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, and the word moment is the word, it comes from the word atomos. It means, we get the word atom from that. It means indivisible, A-T-O-M-O-S, A-T-O-M-O-S. It means a, a, a time that's indivisible. In the twinkling of an eye, 
at. We're going to be, tra we're going to be changed at something. Yep. At the last trump. And this is the last trump, the only time that you find a series of trumpets at the end of time taught in the Bible is in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. And when you find that, that seventh trumpet in the 10th and the 11th chapter, you see the destruction of Babylon by a great earthquake or a great motion to and fro, a great seismos. And we get the word seismology from that Greek word, and it means a to and fro motion. And it doesn't the scripture say that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, showing himself as strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. That's because the seven candlesticks is the church pronouncing judgment. They are the candlesticks, and they are the, the sounding of the trumpets. And the angels will be sounding the trumpets, but it'll be through us because the angels are a picture of the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in us, sounding out the judgment of God. We've said that last week. I won't go through that again. I might hit a little bit of it. And he says, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. When? At the last trump. And what is that? That is at his glorious appearing. Look here the way. Look in 2 Thessalonians. And let's look at how Paul put it to the Thessalonians. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. And this is how he will gloriously appear. Look here in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Read here in verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. The word revealed is the word apocalypto, A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-T-O, apocalypto. And that word apocalypto comes from apo, meaning a removal of the calypto, and that is the word cover. Now, a mystery is a mystery. The word mystery the mystery of iniquity is going to be the mystery of iniquity until God re re rips the cover off and exposes Satan and the Antichrist and everything. As long as there's one man that doesn't know that something is a mystery, then it's still a mystery. And all through the tribulation, it's going to be a mystery that Satan is Satan to the unbelievers, and it's going to be a mystery to them that Jesus is Jesus and who he is and who Satan is and who the Antichrist is. The word mystery is, comes from the word, it is the word M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. It does not mean mysterious. There's two mysteries. The mystery, the mystery of God will be finished, and that's the church in Revelation 10 at the sounding of the seventh trumpet of the angels. And the, and, the, uh, and the mystery of Satan is called the mystery of iniquity. That is the Babylonian system where all the mystery religions came from out of the Mediterranean when you wonder the mystery temples. And that word comes from the word M-U-O. And that means to shut, to shut the mouth. Now when you're, watch, when you're watching one of these mysteries on TV, it's always a mystery. It's not mysterious. Mysterious is smoky and hazy and spooky and, we, and we're looking for ghosts. That's not what mystery means. Mystery just means it's got a cover on it and one day the cover will be ripped off and, and the cover will be removed and everybody will know that will be when Christ comes and turns the light on. We said before that the way you can tell truth, you can tell whether a room's dirty, room's dirty in the middle of the night. If you go in there and turn the light on, you can see the dirt. When Christ comes back at his glorious appearing, that is our hope, not a secret coming, is it? No, sir, it's not. Now look here, now look down here in, and he says, uh, verse 7, chapter 1, And you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven and with his mighty angels in flaming fire. This is going to be like a, just a great flame when he splits the skies. And don't worry about uh, jumping up in the air. It's going to happen in a split second. Don't worry about Jesus taking you out and saying, Oh, come on, God. And I, I noticed they had somebody put out one of these pre-tribulation rapture tapes and they're, they're looking up the sky, waiting for Jesus. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye, and the uh, 
And the scientists tell an eye, tells us an eye twinkles at just a millisecond. Not even a second. It's going to happen so fast, you're not going to have time to look up at the sky and say, there he is. It's going to happen so fast, we won't see it. The only time we'll see it, we'll be all of a sudden, we'll be here, boom, there, and be watching the destruction. And we'll watch, and we won't see, it'll happen so fast, we won't be able to see probably the, the splitting of the skies. Well, if you blink in your eyes, which lasts a lot longer than a point. It'll be a, in gone, we're there. Yeah. That's what a tomo means. Yeah. Yeah. An animal descent. It means just. You can't see that. You can't see that. It means the smallest or most indivisible particle of a second. Now that's how quick we'll be changed, so don't worry about looking up at the sky and say, oh, I hope you take me, Jesus. And, and everybody's going to be jumping up and going, oh, come on. <laughs> Let me go get up on a high mountain and jump up in the air so, uh, so I'll be closer to him when he comes to get me. No, now look here. In flaming, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not, the God, know not God and, they, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we said that the gospel is the resurrection, and that's something a man must obey, and that's daily, because death to self is daily. Now, that's, that's heavy there. Now, look over here in the second chapter. I could go through this. I won't go through this. I might come back and go through it again. But he says that there's two things that keep Christ from coming back. He said, evidently Thessalonica had been told by some word or letter that the coming of Christ had happened. And Paul is saying, no. At the coming of Christ, the end of all things are going to be. And he said, there's two things that, happen, that have to happen first. Two things is what the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians is about. And it refers back to that seventh verse and eighth verse of the first chapter. Chapter headings, chapter two is not inspired. And he says, well, I'll read that first verse. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us. You didn't hear the spirit from us. You didn't hear a word from us. And you didn't get, didn't get a letter from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Some people say Paul was looking at him, for, looking for Christ then. I don't believe he was because he tells us two things have to happen before this happens. He said, first of all, let no man deceive you by any means, verse 3, for that day shall not come except two things happen. First of all, there comes a falling away. That's the word apostasis, apostasy, apo meaning a removal, apo meaning a removal, and stasis Meaning, the upright cross, or the daily cross in the believer's life, we won't go into that, but it comes from stao and histome, meaning to stand upright. And to stand upright meant, that's when it was said that of a man in the first century, he was bearing his cross. So, there was a removal of the daily cross, therefore there's a removal of the gospel, or the resurrection, that he requires obedience to in the first chapter. He says he's going to take vengeance on all those that obey not the resurrection or the gospel. Yes, sir, it's happening right now. The removal of the cross is here. Let's read on down here. Then he says, first of all, the apostasy has come. Well, that's here now, but there's... And see, the people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, the reason they can't see the apostasy is they say the apostasy is some evil demonic church and he's going to look like some hellish thing and he's got fire flying from his eyes and breathing smoke. No, the Antichrist says good words from fair speeches. That's going on right now. And the word Antichrist just means antichristos, and that's those people who deny Christ, and the word deny means contradict. When Jesus says die, strive, that's going on right now. They're contradicting Christ. They're not obedient to the gospel. That's going on. One other thing has to happen. We're in the apostasy now. One other thing has to happen first, and secondly, that man of sin be revealed. What do you think is going to reveal him? The revelation of Christ, the great flaming fire that shines from one end of heaven to the other and we go out to meet God. What's going to reveal Satan is going to be the revelation or the blessed hope and glorious appearing of Jesus. His epiphany. That's what's going to. The word epiphany, when we think of the first epiphany, we think of the birth of Christ, it comes from epi and phanos. And that word Epi means a superimposition all over of the shining. That's the epiphany. 
There's a superimposition of the shining all over the world. The first time the world knew about it because of a star and by the wise men and by the word of God and the world knew about it. The second time, the way they're going to know it ain't going to come slow. It's going to split from one end to the other. And Jesus is going to come back on a great white stallion making war. Oh, me, won't that be great? <laughs> I, I, I look forward to that. Now, let's read on here. He says, that's what we're looking for is the... Now, let me say this. The man of sin has to be revealed. The pre-tribulation raptures, let me tell you what they say. They say, the word revealed is the word apocalypto. It means to take off the cover of the man of sin or the, the world leader of the world system and expose him for who he is. Well, is that going to happen at the beginning of the tribulation? Is he going to be exposed and everybody's going to know who he is and therefore he's going to be exposed? I don't know what else to say. No, he's going to deceive the very elect at the beginning of the tribulation if it were possible, isn't it? Right. So how could it be revealed? What they mean, what the pre-tribulation raptures say is they say, I don't know how I got this, but let me finish it. They say, well, he's going to be revealed. It's going to come out in the paper and it's going to say, Antichrist comes on scene and apostasy begins and the Christian and the, and the Jews are going to say, oh, we, we better do something. They use the word introduced. He's not going to be introduced at the beginning of that. The only thing that's going to determine the beginning of the last seven years is the, is the world leader is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. But that don't mean he's going to be revealed. He's going to be deceiving. They say he's going to be introduced on the world scene, and they turn that into the word apocalypto. Well, it's going to take the cover off. Had one guy... He said, well, I just don't like what you do to that word revealed. I don't do anything to it. I defined it. Apocalypto, remove the cover. And that means exposed, and that ain't going to happen until the end of time. At the epiphany, at the shining, and that's what, that's what it says down here. Let's look on down here. That's what exposes him. Yep, that's what exposes him. Let me, let me just go on down through this, and I'll cover it real quick. This man opposeth. And exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and that's present tense. That's going on right now, and that was going on in the days of Paul. And let me say that opposeth, exalteth, and sitteth, they are all participles. They are not verbs, but a participle is a verbal adjective, and it shows tense. And the tense on that participle, it's present tense. When Paul wrote this, he was saying Satan is setting himself up in the temple of God. This is not the desolation of abomination. I don't even understand how David Brees, Hal Lindsey, or Dave Hunt, or any of the rest of the guys, or Van Hippie, or any of them can understand. This is a participle, guys. And a participle has tense to it. It's a verbal adjective. This is the opposing man of sin is what it is. This is the exalting man of sin, and this is the sitting man of sin, and he sits in the temple of God in the apostasy, and who is the temple of God? That's us, isn't it? So in the apostasy, he sets himself up in the temple of God, and that was going on because Paul said it's already working here. The apostasy is already going on. Do you all understand that? He is an opposing. You know the difference? You understand what I'm saying? As having tense, it was present tense at the time Paul wrote it. He had already set himself up in many, didn't he set himself up in the temple of Hymenaeus and Philetus when they said the resurrection is past? Sure he did. They were already preaching the apostasy because they said the resurrection was a one night thing. I got saved one night salvation when saved is the whole thing. The apostasy had begun. Is that, is that now, is that, if it sets itself up in the, in the believer's heart, is that because the believer has not come to the knowledge of the truth? No, that's because some of them are not strong in the truth and they're being led astray, I believe. I believe he set himself up in the believer's life before he gets strong while the sheep are little baby lambs and he sets himself up and he opposes God 
And he says that he is God. And what does Satan do? He distributes fortunes. That's the very meaning of the word devil. And he says good words in fair speeches. He speaks smooth words. You're the temple of God. And I said it before, but let me say it again. Anyone who sets up a new temple in a literal Jerusalem, if they do that, if they set up a temple and they offer a literal sacrifice, that'll be an abomination to God because Jesus is the one sacrifice for sin in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And after he, offered him, after he offered himself one sacrifice, he went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. I got to get on to the 10th, to the seventh trumpet. He says, remember, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. When I came to Thessalonica, I preached this message to you, and now you know what withholdeth. What does he mean? This whole chapter is about two things that keeping him from coming back the apostasy, and that's going on, and the man of sin has to be revealed. That's the end of time. He's saying, Thessalonians, that happens at the end of time. He hasn't come because we're still here. <laughs> and the world's still here. Now you know what withholdeth, and the word withholdeth is the word kat echo, K-A-T, E-C-H-O. And echo, that comes from the word eschatology, it means hold. When you hold a, a sound, hello, 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 hello. That means to hold. That's what an echo is, a holding. To hold, hold, hold. And kata means down, to hold down. Oh, now you know what holds the church down. That, that's what he's saying, don't you? He's saying, you know, there's two things that's holding the church down. One of them has already started. It's called apostasis, a removal of the cross, no crucifying, no daily dying, and how many S and Philetus are already preaching this doctrine? A one night salvation. I got saved one night. Do you realize how long that's been going on? 2,000 years. Why is it any wonder that the world is so corrupt? Now you know what's holding the church down. Two things, and one of them's what them started, the apostasy. The apostasy was here during the days of Paul. Well, let me tell you something. It was here during the days of Moses and Noah. How about during the days of Adam and Eve? Yeah. Now, he says, now you know what's holding the church down, don't you? Now you, what, now you know what holds down. That he might be revealed in his time. You know what's holding the church down? That Satan will be revealed, that Antichrist will be revealed? Didn't he just get through saying that he has to be revealed? That he might be revealed when it comes time, at the end of time, when the cover will be ripped off and it will be revealed by the brightness of his coming at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. For the mystery of iniquity is already working. The apostasy is already here. That's what he's saying. There's one thing left at this point. Two things have to happen, and one of them has started. Only he who now letteth, that's the word caught echo. The word letteth is the same word as withholdeth. Only he who is holding down. Now, what's the other one other thing that's holding the church down? The removal of the Antichrist and the destruction of the Antichrist. So it's actually God allowing the Antichrist to continue, and that's what holds the church down. Isn't that what it's saying? It's exactly what it's saying. God is the one that allows everything to happen. He does all things. And he allows the Antichrist to continue to, in order that the church will be held down and not taken out. Now, for the mystery of it, he says, Now he who now letteth, kateko, you ought to write that down. I got a line drawn from letteth to withholdeth. And then draw it the side, caught echo, caught all, K A T A, down, echo, hold. You know what's holding the church down? So that she won't be gathered in the air in the first verse. Then he says, Until he be taken out of the way. Who's going to be taken out of the way so the church can go out? The Antichrist. And it's God doing the holding. The Antichrist has to be removed because there's two things that have to happen for him to come to get us. The Antichrist will be revealed and we'll go zipping out to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. 
and then shall that wicked be revealed. Apocalypto. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and out of his mouth is a two-edged sword in the 19th chapter of Revelation when he comes back on a great white steed to make war. Well, that's good. And shall destroy with the epiphany. What is our hope? The appearing, the epiphany. The glorious appearing is our blessed hope. The epiphany. He shall destroy with the epiphany the brightness. Epiphanos. Epiphany is the word brightness. It's a superimposition of the shining. That's what's going... Notice this from the first chapter whom, when in verse 7, when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire. What's going to reveal... What's going to reveal the Antichrist or the word, leader of the world mystery of iniquity? What's going to destroy him is the brightness or the flaming fire or the revelation of Jesus. Satan's going to be revealed. God's going to turn on the light on the world and it's going to be no secret who he is. And then, and then we'll be taken out to meet him. Do, do we see that? Is that real clear? That seems to be real clear to me. And shall destroy with the epiphany of his coming, even him whose, work, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. It'll, he'll come back with the brightness and he'll come back to make war on all those that obey not the gospel and this wicked one will be revealed at our blessed hope, which is the glorious appearing our hope is his glorious appearing, not a secret coming. And that'll be at the sounding of the seventh trump. Let's back up to 1 Thessalonians one more time. Notice he's coming to make war here, isn't he? He's coming to make war. Back to 1 Thessalonians. And we're at that seventh trumpet. I had to come back and cover this because we're the seven candlesticks. Back to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Now here's everybody's favorite verse that likes to talk about a pre-tribulation rapture. David Brees got on TV one day. He said, well, all of the post-tribulation rapturists, the only reason they believe that Jesus is coming at the end of time is God wouldn't be any more, be any more partial to them, so they have to suffer. David, you don't even understand the Bible. If you'd read it, you'd understand there's a whole lot more reasons than just that. And then he said, besides that, they're not, they don't seem to be as intellectual as the pre-tribulation raptures. I hate to say this, but I will. I'll say what Bug, Bugs Bunny said about uh, Yosemite Sam. He's a little maroon is what he is. <laughs> <laughs> I walked through the room and I saw that on TV. He said, he's a little, little maroon y'all know what I mean. Now, look over here in 1 Thessalonians. M-O-R-O-N, that's the way you spell maroon. In 1 Thessalonians 4, <coughs> Mary just got to you start laughing. <laughs> look here at verse 13. <laughs> verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, now let me say something about sorrow. That means to excessively sorrow. When someone dies to go be with the Lord, we're not supposed to cry for 10 years. Just weep and weep and weep and just go into it. They're going to be with Jesus. Don't y'all cry over me when I get to death. I'm going to tell you, I said it the other night, I've had too hard a time getting here. I'm looking forward to it and I'm going to pray, God, make me desire it. Yeah. And if you cry, I'm going to come back and haunt you. <laughs> uh, cry a little while, but not much. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain... Now here's time element again, David Brees. You know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm giving him a hard time because he got on there and said, if you believe in post-tribulation rapture, you're not as smart as him. David, you're brutish. 
That means dull of hearing. You won't hear the word of God. The word brute is the word by art. It means stupid. It means you have the understanding of a brute beast or an animal. And I know you know that because you've studied some Hebrew. So, we which are alive and remain, the word remain is the word paralipo, P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O. It means to survive a holocaust. Well, if this is a secret coming and everything's going along, we can just kind of live the way we want to and until Jesus takes us out of the pre-tribulation rapture and our business is going great guns, hey, I get to go be with Jesus and I don't even have to suffer. Let me tell you, this means there's going to be a great war against the church for three and a half years, the last three and a half years, there's time element. We which are alive and survive, there'll no flesh be saved if he doesn't shorten those days, but for the elect's sake, he'll shorten them. Because they're going to be killing us so fast. And those that are alive and remain, and they survive this holocaust, this great war against the church unto the coming, see the word coming, parousia, his physical arrival, his physical presence. Until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before those which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now he's making war in the first and second chapters of 2 Thessalonians, isn't he? Well, David, Brees, this word shout, even the best of the scholars say, it is the word kalima, or kaluma, K-E-L-E-U-M-A, K-E-L-E-U-M-A, Kalema, and that word kalema comes from the word kaluo, K-E-L-E-U-O, or kelo, and it means an order or a commandment. It is for soldiers by command. It is a war cry. Now, if, now if we're going to be pre-raptured out, what's he doing making a war cry when nobody but the saints are going to hear if this is what this is talking about? And this is their favorite chapter. Isn't it? That's the favorite verse. The words remain and the words shout are time element is what they are. And that happens at the last trump. It happens when Satan is revealed, the, the man of sin is revealed, and he destroys them with his epiphany. And that's our hope, our blessed hope, is his glorious appearing. We're going to see him in all of his glory. And you remember he said, and he said in the 24th chapter that of Matthew, when they, and, and here's another, let me give you another excuse, they say. When the apostles came to Jesus and they said, uh, what's the promise of thy coming? Wouldn't these things be in the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? Well, that's the 24th chapter of Matthew and the pre-tribulation rapture say, well, he's talking to the Jews. They did not say, what will be the sign of thy coming for the Jews and of the end of the world for the Jews? Besides that, he was talking to the apostles, and they were the beginning of the church. And over in the 16th chapter of Matthew, he said, I give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And the keys to the kingdom, the kingdom of God, was an old ancient term for Israel. He said, now the kingdom of God is in you. And they'd give them that key, to, and they'd say, bind and loose, according to this book, to the rabbis. So the church but is spiritual Israel, and it's talking to the church. I want to know who the church was, who the nucleus of the church was in the 24th chapter of Matthew, if it wasn't these apostles. He's talking to the church, and it doesn't even matter, because the point is, they said, what will be the sign of thy coming into the end of the world? And they said, well, he's talking to the Jews. They ask, when are you coming back? I don't even understand that kind of... And he starts in the 29th verse of the same chapter, and he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he said, he'll, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. And he said, he'll gather his elect from the four wind, and he'll send his angels, more than one angel. He's going to send seven angels with a great sound of a trumpet. It's as though it's one trumpet with seven echoes. Seven judgments, that's the seven candlesticks. Let's read to the end of this. Then we which are alive and remain, survive, verse 17, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Wherefore, comfort one another with these words that one day he's going to come back and make war. And those of us that remain will go out to meet him. And those of us that don't survive will come back with him to get the others if we're killed during this. <coughs> now, all right. I, I want you to go over here, back over to Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation 1. And he sees the seven angels. Now, we're talking about he's going to send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet in Matthew 24, isn't he? Well, what if I said seven candlesticks because the word angel is A-G-G E-L-O-S. And those seven angels don't mean they're going to be seven angels coming out of the sky. The seven angels are the seven spirits and the seven candlesticks is the church and these seven are the eyes of the Lord that go throughout the whole earth to and fro. You know what I believe the earthquake's going to be? It's going to be the great judgment that the church is pronouncing because the word to and fro, these seven are the eyes of the Lord that go to and fro and the word seismos means to go to and fro. And the eyes of the Lord is the church, it's the candlesticks, and they bring judgment on God's enemies and they preserve God's elect. Because we're in the midst of the candlesticks with Christ. And let's look here one more time. He says, he sees seven angels in the right hand of Christ, or seven stars in the right hand of Christ. And then he sees, hold on a second, let me get me a drink of water here. I don't think I've spent as much, you know, the more I teach this, the clearer it gets to me. And I hope y'all will kind of bear with me because the seventh trumpet, we talked about the six trumpets last week. The word angel is the word angelos, and it means a messenger. And we are God's messengers, and Paul referred to the, he referred to the, he referred to the uh, uh, preachers of the pastors of the churches as messengers. Now the candlesticks, I said, were seven candlesticks. Seven candlesticks were not actually candlesticks because candlesticks are made of wax and wax candlesticks were very popular during the days of King, uh, King James in 1611. They weren't invented until four or five hundred years ago and they didn't have wax candlesticks back then. They had lamps and the candlesticks. What if I said the candlesticks were the seven trumpets? because out of the trumpet you had seven candlesticks and inside, I'm terrible at this, and inside, inside the candlesticks, they were beaten gold, it was one piece, and the oil was put inside, the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, seven is the number of the refined church, he told Israel he'd multiply, he said I'll multiply your sins times seven, and the oil was a picture of the Holy Spirit, or the message of God, or the word of God, and the oil is what brought fire, and these were beaten golden lamps is what they were. The oil is the picture of the Holy Spirit or the angels or the spirits inside the angels and the candlesticks. Actually, what the trumpets are, a picture of each one of these branches on the candlesticks because it's going to come out of us. Judgment's going to come out of us and what gives us strength to give judgment is the Holy Spirit or truth inside of us. And that's the picture of the angels. Now, here it is. Look here. He says in verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars that they saw in Jesus' hand, and he was standing amidst the candlesticks early in the chapter, are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest, or the seven churches. So if it's the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven churches is the candlesticks. That's a picture of the refined church because I said there's more than seven churches in Asia. Now let's go back over here to Revelation 8. So we see the seven angels. We see the seven angels here in Revelation 8. The first angel sounds in verse 7. Uh, well, let's read here. Let's read in verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God. What are the seven angels? They're the seven, they're seven stars. And that's a picture of the oil. And to them was given seven trumpets. Well, the trumpets that where the angels sound from are the seven candlesticks, and that's the church or the refined church. 
And he says, And I saw the seven angels, that's the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And the trumpets sound judgment, just as when they walked around Jericho, they sounded the trumpets. Then the first angel sounds in verse 7, uh, and we talked about these last week. Verse 8, the, the second angel. Verse 10, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. The, the star is a picture of, the, of our mouths pronouncing the judgment of God, of the two witnesses that pronounce fiery judgment, and out of the trumpets or out of, the, out of each one of the branches of the candlestick comes a fire or comes judgment. And that's the picture of the angel or the flame coming out that. And that's the judgment and that comes from the oil inside the candlestick. I believe the trumpets are a picture of the branches of the menorah. That's what I believe they are because we, that's us. We pronounce, and we're angels in that we have the Holy Spirit in us because we've got the message of God, and the Spirit is truth. So the seven angels is a picture of those seven candlesticks filled with the oil of God, or the Holy Spirit. Oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. Now, now that, then we got, the, we got the, the, the fourth angel. If you want this, I got it on last week's date, the fourth angel in verse 12, chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel, a star falls. So always identify the seven stars of the right hand, hand of Christ as the angels or the messengers of the seven churches and the seven churches are the candlesticks. If the candlesticks are here, the church is here. If the church is here, how can these angels be sounding if the church is gone? That don't even make any sense, does it? I said it last week. If the angels are here and they're the messengers of the seven churches and the seven churches are the candlesticks, how can God have a pre-tribulation rapture and take the seven candlesticks here and leave the angels here to burn out judgment? That's like leaving the oil pointed out on the ground. Well, I'm going to take the candlesticks and put it up here on the shelf. Do your job out there laying on the ground. Why would he give the goats a wake-up call? Yeah. And then, here in verse, uh, we got the sixth angel sounding in... in in verse 13, I had some things I was going to say on this, but I'll get to that about Gog and Magog. I'm not even going to get to that. We've got Gog and Magog and Meshach and Tubal in the McClintics and Strongs up here, but I just had to go back through that because we got the seventh angel sounding. The sixth angel sounds in verse 13, and then in chapter 10, in chapter 10 we see Jesus coming back. This is Jesus. He is called an angel. Verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow. You remember the rainbow? God put his bow in the cloud. It meant a war bow. When the fountains of the great deep were broken up, that word fountain is A-Y-I-N, means an eye, and God's eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth. God brought a great flood. He brought a spiritual quaking is what he brought. And that when he comes back, he's going to be making war. When they place the bow like this, it meant, it, it meant a bow of peace, and when they placed it like this, it meant it wore it. Now, the bow's going to have to be that way, bowing upward when he comes back. If there's a rainbow on his head, figuratively, it has to be bowing upward because that's a war bow he's coming back to execute judgment. Now, let's read on down here. And he says, uh, He was clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face, and the word rainbow, by the way, is the word iris there, there was a rainbow upon his head, and his face was at where the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, that is certainly the image of Christ in the first chapter of Revelation in the tenth chapter of Daniel. And he had a little book in it. Uh, he had in his head a little book, and that's the book that they could find no one worthy to open over there in the fourth chapter. And they found him in the fifth chapter, and it was Christ. And he was as a lamb slain, and he, and he, and he had seven eyes in the fifth chapter of Revelation, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not, and I don't know what they are. Not yet, anyway. I don't know when, we'll know. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever 
who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea things and the sea and the things that, which are therein, and that there should be time no longer. Some people say these are visions in a sequence. How in the world can you have the end of time in the tenth chapter of Revelation and not have the end of time? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> time is no longer. You notice that he swore by himself. Yes. Just like he did. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I didn't notice that. He swore by him that liveth forever and ever. He swore by himself. Or by God the Father and himself that liveth forever and ever. That time should be no longer. The time element of this is the end of time. Boy, that's easy to find out, isn't it? And it's the time element of the finishing of the church and the destruction of Babylon. And we'll get into the destruction of Babylon next week. Here's the seventh trumpet and the series of sounds after which no other trumpet will sound. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, there are seven angels in there. And each one of these, he's going to send his angels, plural, with a great sound of a trumpet or an echo, an eschatos, and at the seventh echo, we will be changed. That's when he says, the mystery of God shall be finished. Now, I don't know why people don't want to believe that this is the church. Because the mystery of God will be finished. David Brees knows what the mystery of God is. He knows too much about the scriptures. David, you know what it is. Quit being so arrogant. Here's time out of it. The mystery of God's going to be finished at the end of time. And here's the mystery of God. He says, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets, that that's the Gentiles would be fellow heirs. Isaiah said it over and over. The Gentiles will come to thy light. Hold your place right there and let's go back over here to Ephesians 3. One more time. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. You know, I wouldn't have picked on David. But he said we were more ignorant than he is, and he was more educated than us. Well, what pride will do to some men is ungodly. Yeah, I don't know. Look here in chapter 3, verse 1, Ephesians, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. This is the mystery of God that will be finished at the sounding of the seventh trump when the seventh angel of the seventh messenger, the seventh branch of the candlestick sounds. He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a foreign few words, whereby when you read, and this is not the mystery of iniquity, there's two mysteries, there's the mystery of God, and here it is, that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And Isaiah told us that mystery. He said, the Gentiles will come to you light, and that's what Paul says, which in other ages was not made known. They were the spirits in prison. We were the spirits in prison for 2,000 years. And prison means to be locked in darkness or light. We're prisoners of Christ in the light now. We were, the Gentiles were prisoners in darkness. And, to, and the word forgiveness means to be pardoned and released from prison. It's the word aphesis. And you have to repent to be released from prison. We were locked in prison. It was hidden through the ages. The mystery of Christ was, it was made known unto the sons of men. It wasn't made known unto the sons of men. It was hidden through the ages. As it is now revealed at Pentecost, Acts 2, where the Gentiles, all flesh, red, yellow, black, and white, as well as the Jews. Boy, how far could we go with this? unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit or by the truth that, here's the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. The New Testament church is finished. Here's the mystery of God that will be finished. It's a sounding. David, that is time element. You guys don't even talk about time element. I might name this tape. A message to David Brees. Don't be so arrogant, David. You don't know everything. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. That. That's a, that is a preposition referring back to the mystery. That's the mystery of God that will be finished when Christ puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea. And of the same body as who? As the Jews, there's one body. That's the church he's going to make up to one new man, he says up there in verse 15 of the previous chapter. And boy, we could go into the abolishing of the handwriting of ordinances, and now there's a spiritual Israel, and he only nailed the ordinances to the cross. He didn't nail the law to the cross. He only gives the law to those he loves. 
and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's the mystery. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. We know that Paul was a minister to the Gentiles, don't we? There's the mystery. Given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints in this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. There's a mystery, isn't it? You know what he's saying? Yes, sir, he is. And to make all men, all nations, pass ho, whosoever, all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ and the Gentiles as a whole, as an international people, did not have that opportunity to you know, Acts 2 where he poured out of his truth on all flesh, red, yellow, black, white, and all of them. There's the mystery. And he talks about this mystery over here when he says husband love your wives even Christ loved the church in the fifth chapter and gave himself for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word in verse 26 that he can present it that that he might present it without glorious uh, that he might send himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish and this is the extension of the gospel of the Gentiles and he says I he says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now let's go back over and read that verse one more time. We know what the mystery is, don't we? It's the church. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be finished, read it one more time, but in the days of the voice of the last trumpet. Verse 7 of chapter 10 of Revelation. You can say it that way, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the seventh angel is the last in a series of sounds after which no other trumpet shall sound, isn't it? Then when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, the Gentile church will be finished. That's the first thing that's going to happen at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And Babylon is going to be destroyed. The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And look at chapter 11, the great earthquake. I believe this earthquake is going to be a spiritual earthquake. Very well may be a literal one too. But he's talking about in verse 13. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake there was slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe, there were four, there were four trumpets, and then the last three trumpets were three woes, because it was great devastation upon the earth. And he says, the third woe cometh quickly, and it comes with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and it is the destruction of Babylon. At the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is finished, and at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, Babylon is destroyed, and the time element of Babylon being destroyed is in the 16th and the 18th and the 19th chapters of Revelation. He says right here, the seventh angel sounded. You see, the time element of verse 15 is the same as the time element of verse 7 of chapter 10, isn't it? Y'all see that? The time element, he's saying the same thing in verse 15 of chapter 11 as he's saying in verse 7 of chapter 10, isn't he? Huh? The seventh angel sounds in verse 7 of chapter 10, and the seventh angel sounds in verse 15 of chapter 11. He just simply tells two different things is going to happen at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The eschatos trumpet, the last trumpet, the last in a series, and the only place you're going to find a series, Mr. Brees, where there's a last in a series is in the seventh, is the eighth, ninth, and tenth, and the eleventh chapters of Revelation. You find that seventh or that last one, and he puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and says, time will be no more. See, this is not in a series. We know that these two chapters are congruent chapters. They fit one upon the other. That's a mathematical term, but it means one fits on the other. They are simultaneous. They have to be simultaneous. The seventh trumpet sounds here, and it sounds over there. In the first, in seventh verses, tenth chapter, the mystery of God is finished. But here's what happens at the sounding of the seventh trumpet in verse 15 of chapter 11. 
the seventh angel sounded, and here's what happens. And there were great voices in heaven saying, at the sounding of this trumpet, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Not for a thousand years. Not for a thousand years and not for seven more years. When he comes back with his glorious appearing, it'll be at the signing of the seventh trumpet, and all of Christ's enemies will be, con will be conquered. Now, hold your place there and think of the seventh trumpet when the mystery of God is finished and when Babylon is destroyed. Go back over here to Philippians, Philippians, the third chapter, and look at this one more time. <laughs> I'm not trying to give David Brees a hard time, but he's very arrogant sometimes. David, you need to listen to this. Now look here in Philippians 3, because he's talking about these two verses right here in Philippians 3 and 21. He's talking about these two verses. Because we're going to be changed at the last trump, and all of his enemies are going to be destroyed at the last trump, particularly Babylon, isn't he? Yes. And Babylon is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth, and we find the destruction of Babylon. The 18th chapter, the 17th chapter describes Babylon. The 18th chapter shows her destruction. So when you go from the 16th chapter to the 19th chapter, the 17th and the 18th chapters of Revelation are a parenthesis just to describe what he's destroying at the end of the 16th chapter, and I'll show you that in just a second. Now look here. He's talking about these two verses, verse 15 of chapter 11 and verse 7 of chapter 10. He's saying it before John says it. He says, speaking of Christ Jesus, verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. When is that? That's at the last trump, isn't it? Right? Yes. And when the mystery of God is finished, that's the church, that's our change at the seventh or the last trump. He's going to change our body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working. That word working is the word energia, E-N-E-R-G-E-I-A, and it means effectual working or operation. The same operation that changes our bodies, Revelation 10 and 7, is going to be, he'll do it according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. When he subdues the world, our bodies will be changed by the same operation. This is a referral directly to something that John had not written yet to Revelation 10 and 7 and Revelation 11 and 15. 10 and 7, the mystery of God will be finished at the signing of the seventh trumpet. That is our vile bodies being changed at the last trump according to the working where he subdues all things unto himself. And the seventh trumpet sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll reign forever and ever. Does that make sense? No. Certainly it does. And that's also 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Second, yes. Let's look at that. Yes, that's the same thing when he conquers. Well, we've already looked at it, but he conquers the Antichrist by his appearing, right? And he said, you know what holds the church down? You know what keeps you from being changed is the destruction of Satan, the Antichrist, the world system of Babylon. He's saying the same thing in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. You know what's holding the church down? You're only going to be changed when Satan is going to be destroyed, he's going to be revealed and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. That'll destroy Babylon. And go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. 15. And he says... Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. We said that the 144,000 was the firstfruits. Jesus is going to be on the earth, but the firstfruits was the bread crop, and the church was the bread. We being many are one bread. The 144,000 being the firstfruits in the 14th chapter of Revelation. And afterward they that are Christ at his parousia, his coming, his physical appearance, 
Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. All the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, and the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ when he changes our bodies at the last trump. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He cannot come at the beginning of the tribulation. People are going to die all the way through. And when his enemies are destroyed, that's when we're going to get our change. Isn't it? There can't be a thousand years after all this is over because he's going to reign forever and ever when our bodies are changed. There ain't going to be more, no more dying. He's going to, y'all see that? The last enemy of conquer is death. And that's when our bodies are changed. How in the world can Satan rise a thousand years later? The kingdom of God is in you. It's not a happening later on. It's in us. I don't have time to go in millennium. Now, let's go back over here and let's look at that. I don't think I ever made it this clear. I hope, I hope this is as clear as I can make it. Do y'all see this? Yeah. It's very clear, isn't it? 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, goes with the last verse of Philippians, the third chapter, and those go with these verses in the 10th chapter and the 7th verse of Revelation and the 15th verse of the 11th chapter. You see that those synonymous, how they're parallel and how they're congruent one to the other? Now look over here in 16th chapter. Let's look at this earthquake and see the destruction of Babylon. Here it is, 16th chapter. And look here at verse 17. Under the seventh angel pouring out, we said last week that the sounding of the trumpets was the sounding of the judgment and the pouring out of the bowls. And those bowls that they poured down on the enemy off of the side of a city, that was to destroy the enemy. This is the picture of those bowls. And the, si and the bowls pouring out was the pouring out of the judgments. And when he pours out the judgment, he destroys all of his enemies, and he says the same thing. Look here in verse 17. And the seventh angel, the seventh angel, when he sounds, he pours out the judgments. The seventh, we said last week, each one of these trumpets, each one of these trumpets corresponds with each one of these vials. Because we noticed last week, we read through them, they all do the same thing. They do the corresponding things, the bowls to the vials. When you read the, when you read the, uh, excuse me, the trumpets to the vials. When you read the trumpets in, in eight, nine, and eighth, and ten, ninth, and tenth chapters, and the eleventh chapter of Revelation, come over to the sixteenth chapter and look at the bowls, and compare one trumpet one with bow one, trumpet two with vial two, trumpet three with vial three, and so forth, and trumpet seven with the seventh bowl of the seventh vial. Because when the vial is poured out, the same thing happens at the sounding of the trumpet. You remember when they sounded the trumpets? Over there in the book of Joshua, judgment was immediate as soon as the trumpet sounded. Boom, it's done. Now, look at this. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of God from the throne saying, It is done. It's over. It's finished. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Same earthquake as over yonder in the 11th chapter, same as the one in the 6th chapter. Such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, his total destruction. That's, do you see that? And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. I don't know why people don't think this is the end of time. <laughs> and why they don't think when Jesus puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea in the seventh chapter, that that's not the end of time. I don't understand that. This is the end of time. Sounds like, doesn't it? And, every, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven. And this is the time element of this is the second chapter, Second Thessalonians. The fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, the 24th chapter of Matthew, after the tribulation of those days, he'll send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's the time element. The time element is the seventh verse of the 10th chapter, the 15th verse of the 11th chapter, isn't it? Certainly it is. Mr. Maurice, <laughs> pick it on you, man. 
And there fell upon me in a great hell out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And you know what you can do? You can go straight from here to the 19th chapter because the 17th chapter describes the harlot of Babylon, tells you who this is that God is devastating at the end of the 16th chapter. Always think of this. The 17th chapter tells who she is. She's that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. There in the last verse, she sits upon the up on the beast, she sits upon the waters. The beast is the world ruling system, and the waters where she sits is peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And that beast rises out of the water. He describes her completely in the 17th chapter, and he talks about her being a burnt mountain, a destroyed mountain, and she is a system of wealth and self. She's a system of self esteem, and I believe America leads all of this. So when you see that 16th chapter, you see her destruction. You see the same corresponding vials to the corresponding trumpets. And under the seventh vial, you see the destruction of Babylon, just like you see in the 15th verse of the 11th chapter, just like you see in the 10th verse of the, of the of seventh verse of the 10th chapter, you see the mystery of God finished. You see Babylon is destroyed, and when he changes our bodies, he'll do it according to the same operation whereby he subdues all his enemies and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And what he's doing, when you see the destruction of Babylon in 16 and 19, and you see the destruction of Babylon in 11 and 15, and you see the change of our bodies in 10 and 7, all of that corresponds to the 18th chapter. The 18th chapter is that great destruction he describes in 16 and 11. And the same earthquake that he describes in the 6th chapter. It's the same earthquake because the 6th chapter is a panoramic view when he says, I beheld when he had opened the 6th seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell into the earth. And that's the seven judgments of God that come from the seven trumpets which is the seven branches of the seven candlesticks and that's the church and that's the refined church during the tribulation after she's made, been made war with for three and a half years she's going to be a purified church pronouncing judgment and will die but those that are alive and remain after three and a half years of persecution, after the greatest holocaust the world has ever seen against Christians, we which are alive and survive will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And they all happen at the same time. Do you all see that? Do you see that, Novi? Huh? You're going to be here during tribulation, people. We're going to be changed at the last trump. Like there in Joshua where they went into Jericho and they had the, uh, the, the seven prisoners, the seven trumpets, and then all of the children of Israel shouted. They the shouted and the walls fell down. Judgment was boom, immediate. When the trumpets sound, the bowls are poured out immediately. Boom. That's it. The first one sound, the first trumpet sounds, the first bowl, second, second bowl. Boom, two, two, two. Just like. Yeah. And he has already delivered us through wrath by his blood in Romans, the fifth chapter. And 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10 says we are delivered through wrath. That's already happened. We've already, it's already happened to us. He hasn't appointed us unto wrath but unto salvation. The opposite, the opposite of wrath is salvation. The opposite of wrath is not the destruction of our, the saving of the bodies. Because these bodies are going to die anyway. No matter what happened to these bodies. Let's just read some of this 18th chapter. This is the destruction of Babylon. This is what the 15th verse of Revelation 11 is talking about. This is what the 16th chapter, when he says Babylon is coming and remembers before God, in the 19th chapter, the pouring out of the seventh bowl. The trumpet and the bowl are just immediate, synonymous. The trumpet sounds, the bowl's pour. You see that? Then the destruction of Babylon is spoken of. Here's the parentheses. 17 and 18 is a parentheses. That's what it is. Keep that in mind. And let's just read some of this. And he says in chapter 18, verse 1, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Why did he say it twice? Because first Babylon fell, never to rise again in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah, 
and this Babylon is a spiritual worldwide system of self and wealth and let us make us a name and it falls here is fallen is fallen to Babylon's that's where it comes from and has become the habitation of Daemons devils distributors of fortunes that's what Babylon is boy is the United States a part of it or the leader of it. Covetousness is idolatry and means to want more. This nation preaches that devil of doctrine of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And the word hold and the word cage are the word phalake, philoso. Prison. It's the prison. What's pri imprisons man is wanting more covetousness and daemons or devils. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we said this morning that she's made the world drunk and the earth is mad. Mad was halal and what makes people drunk is pride. The word halal means to boast. And the halal belong to God. Hallelujah. Halal Jah. Boy, you can't even get away from this, can you? And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, money and things and stuff. America, the reason men can't find American prophecy, they don't know how wicked she is. Whew. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. He's telling us to come out. Yes, sir. And you know what, you know what's going to destroy Babylon? If you look at the ten toes that are made of clay and iron, there's one part of that image of Nebuchadnezzar in the second chapter that's not a part of Babylon. That's the miry clay. I believe that's a picture of the church in Babylon. When those toes are crushed, the only purpose for the image is to put Israel in check, is to be a sword to cause Israel to be obedient, and we're spiritual Israel. And when he crushes those toes, it's that clay that's going to break. And when the clay comes out of Babylon, the image falls. Whew. <laughs> huh? Yes, sir. The only purpose, you know, the only thing that holds Babylon up is that she's got Israel in her. Yes. Her whole purpose is to be a sword in the hand of God. David said, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword. And the whole purpose of Babylon, the only purpose of Babylon is to be a sword against Israel. To scourge Israel, called her to come to obedience. And when Israel comes out of Babylon, when the toes are crushed and the clay is destroyed, there's no purpose for Babylon to stand. And the only part, you confuse gold with brass. You confuse brass with silver, but you can't fuse clay with anything. And the only thing in Babylon that don't belong in Babylon that's keeping her standing up is the clay. Look here. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her plagues. And when, when the church comes out of Babylon, that's when she's going to fall. They receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached into heaven. Her sins are money and things and stuff and pride and self and boasting and wealth. And God hath remembered her iniquities, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, filled her double, her pride and her boasting and her self-esteem. America, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. That's what Jerusalem said when she was called the daughter of Babylon in the 47th chapter of Isaiah. I won't be any widow. I won't die. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, a burnt mountain in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah. That by this same operation, this is the operation that will change our mortal bodies. David, I don't appreciate you saying things you say without thinking. This is a David Bruce message to and she shall be utterly burned with fire, but for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. We're talking about the American system right here, people. The reason they can't find America is because she's filled with pride and arrogance and boasting. And America's deceived at who she is. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. Isn't, doesn't everybody love America? Don't they want to come here? This is the Babylonian system. 
This is the Roman system. They moved their capital to Washington. It used to be in Rome and it used to be in Babylon, the Euphrates. We got their unholy Christ mass, unholy days, and we got all of their, we got their emblems, and we even got their senate. We got their own senate. Isn't that something? Shall be well her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Remember, she'll be a burnt mountain over in Jeremiah. She's a mountain of pride and self and self-esteem. America is the nation of self-esteem, and it is America that's polluting the world with this doctrine of capitalism. Get, get what you can get. Fill your pockets full. There ain't no government that'll rule the church. Standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, that mighty city, for in one hour is... Thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep. Why the merchants? Because it's buying and selling mm -hmm. money, things, and stuff. And it gives a list of all the things that were wonderful in the first century, all of the woods and the stones and the things that men coveted after. I said it before, if it was a modern list, it would have Cadillacs and town cars and Rolls Royces and IRAs and investments and rental properties and all the things that we want, money and stuff. They shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise. Notice merchants and merchandise. Any more the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple. Only the rich could wear purple. It was against the law for the poor to wear it. It was too expensive. It come out of the mollusk off of Tyre and Sidon. Just a small ounce of one come out of one little mollusk and silk and scarlet and, and, ma and all manner of vessels and finite wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ornaments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men slaves. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. It's all gone. Babylon is fallen. This is her destruction of the 16th chapter, the 11th chapter, the 15th verse, when our bodies will be changed at the signing of the last trump. This is the conquering of all of his enemies right here. This 18th chapter is a description of the last trump. What's going to happen? We're going to go out to meet him, and he's destroying this world system of self and wealth. All the things that thy soul lusted after. Isn't that good? The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off, or he... Now, y'all recognize this? I didn't understand this when I was young. But when you're reading it, it's very simple. It's just all the wealth of the first century. It's equating it to the wealth of today. It's a parallel which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and waiting, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, it is more than Roman Catholicism. It is more just than the old Babylonian Empire. It's all the world system of wealth and self and me and what I want. It's everything the devil's message is about. The word devil meaning daemon, meaning distribute fortunes. The devil's mystery of iniquity will be destroyed. This is the time element of the brightness of his coming. And scarlet decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour. And that's the ten kings that will have power with the beast one hour to destroy this great system. And in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade, notice trade merchants and merchandise, trade by sea, stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wedding, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein was made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate, a very short period of time. At the end, the judgments will fall, boom, it's gone, and will be changed at the signing of that trump. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. She's not just the one little city over there on the Euphrates River. That's don't rule the earth. It's a system of wealth. It's the devil's doctrine is what it is. For God hath avenged you on her, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. It will be a violent overthrow by God himself. Do you all realize it's going to have to be an economic earthquake? Uh-oh. 
We don't want to hear that, do we? When it happens, we'll all be worth nothing and shall be found no more at all. And the voices of the harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters and rock stars shall be heard no more at all in the, in the country stars and the dancing and the going out to nightclubs. It's all over. And no craftsmen going to concerts. It's not over. No more fancy fine furniture. Craftsmen and whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. No more fine handmade automobiles. No more fine handmade leather coats. And the sound of a millstone shall no more be heard at all in thee. The millstone ground the grain for the bread. No more bread. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. It'll be all darkness. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries, formakia, witchcraft, smooth words, kosam, were all nations deceived. And in, it's not talking about literal drugs. It's talking about the sorcerers, the smooth talkers. We said that word witch, when, when the Lord told Saul, he said, when Samuel told Saul, he said that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. He used that word kosom, and it meant to distribute by lot, to distribute fortunes. The drug of the air. Yeah, and that, and that, the, that, the, that the priest divined for money, and these were the diviners, and they did it for money in Israel. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all that were slain upon the earth. It's, talking, it's not talking about one little old city in Babylon. I don't know where in the world they ever come up with that. It's a worldwide city of self and wealth. And the United States heads it all. And at the destruction of this Babylon, the trumpets of the seven candlesticks will be sounding at the seventh sounding of the seventh trumpet we'll receive our new bodies by the same operation where he does this thing in the 18th chapter. And you can see it in the 19th chapter when he comes back in verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire. He comes back on a white horse. He comes back making war. This is also the same thing. This, these are all pictures of the same thing. He describes it in 18 and he shows the ferocity of Christ coming back in chapter 19. See, 19... 18 is a description of what's happening in 19, and it's also a description of the seventh vial in chapter 16, and it's a description of, of the judgment that's coming of, this, of the seventh trumpet in 11 and 15, and in 10 and 7, when the mystery of God has finished the church. It's going to happen at the same time. I don't think we painted that picture quite that way, but I hope you can see this clearer than ever before. He's going to change our vile body where it will be like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. And the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he'll reign from ever and ever from then on. When he, and that's the time element of the changing of us. We're going to live in the tribulation and we'll die, many of us, but we which are alive and survive until the sky splits. We'll go out to meet him. I hope we can say this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your truth. You're a wondrous God. I don't even know what to say, Lord, because we live in this system. It oppresses us. Lord, it's this free will that causes men to seek self. And they don't know that you require a crushing. You require a devastation in our lives. You require the fiery trial to get rid of this Babylonian system. That's why you said to Peter, if you'll say to this proud mountain of Babylon, be removed. When he got to arguing with you, and when we get to seeking things of life, we're arguing and contradicting you, and we're being antichrist. God, deal with our hearts and let us see these truths. We will praise you and glorify you, Lord, because you are all things. All things are by and for you. We praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.